Welcome everybody to our webinar today. You've joined the ANS webinar about um, changes to our DOI service. Uh, essentially the idea here is that we um, address a number of questions that have already come to us and we have an opportunity to ask additional questions. So my name is Gerry Ryder. I work with the Australian National Data Service. I'm based in uh, Adelaide. So we have um, three speakers today uh, and we'll try and keep uh, to time so we have plenty of time for your questions. Um, we have Adrian Burton who is Director of Services for ANS based in Canberra and the DOI service is one of his areas of responsibility. Natasha Simons who is a Senior Data Management Specialist with ANS and she's based up in Brisbane. Many of you will know uh, Natasha through her work with the repository community and her involvement in call. And then myself, Jerry Ryder here, based in Adelaide. So we'll start today with Adrian, and then um, Natasha and I will address some of the some of the questions that have already come to us. So we'll start with Adrian giving us an overview of the ANS DOI service, and then looking at what's changed uh, recently with the service and why that's changed. Then Natasha and I will work through quite a number of questions that have already been put to us, and thank you to those who did respond to our call four questions ahead of time so we could target this session to meet your needs. Then we'll have time for your questions and we've also got some um, additional sources of information that you might uh, find useful after today. So handing over now to Adrian to uh, kick us off. Thanks Adrian. We'll start with uh, just an overview of uh, digital object identifiers because that's the service that we're talking about today. Just uh, so um, let's clarify what we're trying to do with the service because some of the questions will be around scope and you know what's in and out, so I thought we might just start with this. So we're doing a digital object identifier. It's something that allows us to uniquely identify the content. Um, and of course, the history of DOIs that's come from the publishing area that publishers uh, needed to um, uniquely identify journal articles. Uh, uh, it provides uh, a link to the location, so not only an identifier, but it's a, you know, a URL as well as a, an identifier, so it does provide that link to the location on the internet. So it's doing two things already, uh, just gives us a, a unique identifier, but not all unique identifiers are clickable. These ones are. <coughs> not only that, w when they're clickable, if the URL was sort of hardwired in, uh, then if ever the, you know, the location were to change, uh, then it would be out of date. You'd get your 404 error. Uh, and again, in the journal area, uh, quite often one journal is bought out by another journal and the URL of the, of the journal article changes because now it belongs to a new publisher. Or, so they thought about this and so the uh, location can be updated if the location changes, if the object itself moves you know, to a different server, has a different URL, it can be updated, uh, which is a really good thing. It's at a level of indirection that's called from an engineering point of view and has, you know, just means that the DOI number that's out there being published to the world, you know, millions of people have got this uh, identifier. Uh, now you don't have to tell each individual person, oh, we've changed the server location. You update it within the DOI system and then the, the redirect happens uh, automatically. So that's uh, um, you know, one of the functions that we host, the reasons why people use such a service. This, but there are other, so we talked about you know, an identifier, it's a clickable identifier, it's a persistent identifier, but there are several of those, you know, handle, arcs, etc. There's quite a few different ways of having persistent identifiers. The DOI is a persistent identifier that has been optimised for referencing scholarly works. So it's been optimised for that particular purpose. So one of the one of the repercussions of that is that there is uh, metadata. There's a mandatory metadata set that's uh, linked to a, a DOI, and that metadata set uh, just assumes uh, a scholarly object. So it asks you, you know, you know who, who's the author. Um, What's the title of it? When was it created? You know, who publishes it, etc. So these are questions that you would only ask about a scholarly work, and that's part of the DOI's job to be optimised for identifying 
uh, scholarly works and particularly for that use case of referencing uh, a scholarly work and providing a citation. So we've come here, a DOI is a, is a, unique, a globally unique identifier, it's resolvable, it's persistent, uh, and it's been optimised for scholarly works. It has another uh, feature uh, that the, you can either click on the metadata, uh, click on the link and it'll take you to the object that you've identified, so your scholarly work. Or you can go to the DOI system and say, oh, just give me all the metadata about that object. So just given the DOI number, you can, you can then also know anything that's in the metadata. And because uh, this has been optimised for scholarly works, you, you can know. Uh, if someone just gives me a DOI number, then my system can know with confidence that it will find out uh, who the author is, what the title is, you know, those kind of things. So it gives you, it's um, uh, something that you can rely on uh, to have this extra information and to have that function. So quite often you can just exchange the DOI numbers and then uh, that makes information exchange very simple, uh, saying this data set is related to that DOI uh, and then you can use the DOI system to get all that extra information. You don't have to worry about uh, exchanging that as well. So that's a feature. Um, and the last thing is that uh, the DOI is used in a number of the indexing uh, systems, global indexing systems that index references. So your Scopuses and your, your Thomson Reuters, um, you know, they have built-in systems, Crossref obviously uh, have built-in systems that are uh, use DOIs to track what is uh, happening with references. Uh, so a number of the uh, indexing systems, systems globally uh, are optimised to use uh, DOIs. Uh, so that's uh, an overview of that. So the ANS, ANS runs a DOI service. Um, it's important to note that it's part of the national research infrastructure. So NCRIS is you know, a piece of that uh, national research infrastructure. Uh, it's operated by ANS, um, so the reason we operate it is to allow research organisations to mint DOIs for data. Uh, so all those things I talked about on the first slide, we want to have a, a unique identifier for data, we want it to be clickable, we want it to be persistable, uh, persistent, it can, uh, we want it to be uh, optimised for uh, talking about uh, data as a scholarly work and we want it to be optimised uh, to be found in these kind of reference indexes, indexes of references to works. So all that's, that's the reason why it exists, in order to bring data into that uh, whole world. Uh, we're not the only people in the world who have thought of that. In fact, uh, we do this as part of a big consortium, a global consortium, called Datasite, which um, uh, is one of the consortiums uh, that run uh, the DOI, that, that are part of the International DOI Foundation. The Datasite Consortium, as its name says, uh, is a set of people, a set of organisations globally who are committed to making uh, the citation and referencing and identification of data a straightforward thing and to make it, uh, to make data, if you like, a first class object, uh, a first class output of research. The Data Site Consortium uh, sits alongside Crossref at that very top level of, of consortiums that do uh, DOI services and in the very broad, uh, Crossref is a consortium of journal publishers. As I said, they were the ones who actually kicked off DOI and it, uh, for a very long time Crossref was the only, um, uh, was DOI, there was no other consortiums at that top level. Top level. Broadly, cons uh, Crossref caters for the needs of journal publishers and Datasite was uh, formed in order to uh, cater for the needs of data publishers, of data repositories, data centres. We will go into some of the details about that, but that's why data site it, it exists, and that's you know, how we get some of the scope of uh, what's in scope for um, data site. Uh, we might go on to the next um, slide there. So what's changed now? So now we're saying that uh, this service that was part of an uh, Australian national data service for allocating identifiers to data, 
we've looked at it and with you know a marginal uh, increase in our service we can provide a very good service to uh, grey literature which wasn't originally you know a focus for uh, ANS but it has been suggested to us by the community particularly through call that this would be a good uh, expansion for our service. When you're using our service now for uh, grey literature we do also ask that you use the resource type that means you tell us that this is the thing being identified is some text uh, and you know, there are options and we'll go into those, the encoding options for saying what particular type of text it is. So there are the things that, that's changed there. It's you know, This is a service that's part of national infrastructure and will continue to be where now the spirit of it is that um, a lot of our customers are institutional repositories and they're using it for um, the data objects that are in the institutional repository. There's no reason why they shouldn't be able to use it for the uh, grey literature um, and related items as well. Some things haven't changed, uh, whether it's a, a data set or a piece of grey literature. We expect that the item being identified by the DOI is a citable part of the scholarly record. We expect that the people who are, that the organisation that's minting a DOI is the one that actually manages the uh, uh, the and has long-term custodianship of the uh, object or the scholarly work that's being identified. And we expect that uh, that continuity of access, you know, appropriate to the scholarly record, uh, so for an appropriate number of years. That would be expected to uh, half life of a journal article in that particular um, in that particular discipline that uh, the, the repository would maintain access um, or that you have some kind of a, a plan to maintain access for that for that time. So that's uh, just an overview of uh, the service, what we offer, how, uh, why we offer it, uh, the changes that have been made, and why those changes have been made. I think we now move on to. Uh, Natasha, for a few more details in, the, in these areas. Uh, so we're on to scope of the DOI service. So ANS announced the change in the scope for our DOI minting service on the 5th of April. And in extending it to grey literature, we needed to define the term grey literature because uh, it's a bit of a hazy term and it means sort of different things to different people perhaps. So we included some in of the type of material that we mean when we when we talk about grey literature. And we mentioned theses, reports, unpublished conference papers, newsletters, creative works, preprint journal articles, technical standards and specifications for which the institutional repository is the primary publication point. We also noted some of the things that would be out of uh, scope, that's for the AND service, not for DOIs in general, and they were published peer-reviewed journal articles, ephemera, teaching and learning materials and book chapters. And if you wish to assign a DOI to these types of materials, then you need to go through another DOI registration agency, uh, such as Crossref. So just to point out that the change in um, the DOI policy for ANS is in line with the data site business model principles. So as Adrian mentioned, ANS acts as an agent for the data site DOI registration agency and grey literature is well within the scope of that service. And if you'd like to look that up, you can look up the data site business model principle document yourself. The, the link is included there. So what's in scope for this service? Um, these are just running through some of those questions on notice. So we were asked, could this the ANS service uh, be used for DOIs for journals hosted by our universities. So some examples of those journals might be the Queensland Archaeological Research Journal, which is hosted by UQ Library. Um, a lot of these journals use the OJS software. And our answer to that was no, because these journals are not grey literature. So therefore you have to consider alternative uh, DOI registration agencies like Crossref and get your DOIs through them. Another question was uh, that book chapters are listed as being out of scope, as I mentioned earlier. What about edited e-books e published by our institutional repository? Can we assign a DOI to individual chapters? You could, as long as the institutional repository is the only publication point. 
So we're concerned here that there's a risk of creating multiple DOIs if it is a formally published book and a DOI has already been assigned and assigned to those chapters. Other questions we were asked, can DOIs be assigned to creative works such as exhibitions, performances and presentations? And that's clearly within the scope of the AN service and for DataCite as well. As long as these things are a citable contribution to the scholarly record and can fulfill, fulfill the basic requirements for DOI minting, i.e. there's a minimal amount of metadata required. Another question was, can we mint DOIs for preprints and postprints held in our institutional repository? Yes, DOIs can be assigned to preprints, but not generally to postprints. So the advice here is that a postprint should refer to the DOI assigned by the publisher. I just want to note here that Crossref just, I think about a week ago perhaps, announced that you can actually mint DOIs for preprints via their service now. That's, they've expanded the scope of their service to include preprints. So therefore you have a choice of DOI registration agencies. If you're going to assign a DOI to preprints, you could use the AND service or you could use Crossref or another DOI registration agency. Here's a tricky one. Can DOIs be assigned to blogs, reports to government, academic websites when captured in the institutional repository? They can. Again, we go back to those overarching questions. So are they citable contributions to the scholarly record? And can they fulfill the basic requirements for minting DOIs? So if you're thinking about assigning DOIs to this type of material, you need to think about whether you can guarantee persistent access to these types of materials over time and if you have agreement to mint a DOI from the resource owner. So uh, if you mint a DOI to a blog that points to somebody's blog instead of stores it in your institutional repository, then perhaps there's an issue there. You may not be able to maintain long-term access to that blog. So these are just things to think about when you're, when you're looking at those types of materials. Can DOIs be assigned to conference posters? Yes, absolutely. And again, go back to those overarching questions about how you can provide persistent access to that over time. And lastly, a question, can DOIs be assigned to tweets? I guess you could apply some of the criteria listed above. Is it a citable contribution to the scholarly record and so forth? But I think in general, it's better to tweet a DOI than to put a DOI on a tweet. And this is about your ability to guarantee persistent access to that tweet over time and having agreement to mint the DOI from the resource owner. Thanks, Natasha. So Natasha's talked a bit about what's in scope and hopefully we've covered most of your questions about what's in scope for the ANS DOI service. Another kind of type of question we received was what do I need to do? So how do I get started? So uh, for those organisations that are already using the AND service to mint DOIs for data, they will have already um, completed a Cite My Data agreement, which is the agreement that we have with institutions who are using the DOI service, essentially where they agree to ensure that the DOIs they mint uh, using the service remain persistent over time. The question was, do I need another agreement for minting uh, for grey literature? And the answer is no. If you already have an agreement in place, that agreement is fine to cover the additional resource type. Uh, but if you haven't previously used the AND service, you will need to complete uh, one of the agreements. And uh, at the end of this slide presentation, there are a few links that would take you to this sort of information on the ANS website. The ANS DOI service is offered as a manual minting service or a machine-to-machine -machine service. So depending on the volume um, of uh, DOIs that you mint and perhaps where you are in your technical development for um, services, people can use either or, or even both if they choose. The question was raised, can I use either of those minting options to mint DOIs for grey literature? And again, yes, uh, you can use either option. The service makes no real distinction in terms of what type of materials being uh, having a DOI minted for it. Organisations that are already minting DOIs through the service have uh, an account with us uh, that allows the technical infrastructure to talk to each other. So the ANS uh, DOI service and the institutional infrastructure. Uh, 
uh, and the question was asked, do we need a separate account if we're um, minting DOIs for grey literature held in one repository when our data is held in another repository? So really a question about location of the resource and, and whether that determines whether a new account is needed. Um, and the answer there is no, you don't need another account. In fact, ANS does prefer one account per institution where possible, but we recognise that in some cases a different approach may work better for you, um, but it's certainly not an, a requirement to um, establish a separate minting account um, if you're holding your grey literature in one repository and your data in another and are minting DOIs for both. Some people um, obviously have lots of grey literature that they are thinking about the potential to assign DOIs to and we have had the question about the ability to bulk mint. Now ANS doesn't offer a, currently a bulk minting service as such. It is something on our roadmap but we do have the ability to automate the minting of a high number of DOIs and we have worked with one or two organisations who have had that particular requirement. So uh, we suggest there that you do contact us if you do have this particular requirement and we could uh, have a discussion with you about what might be possible. As Adrian mentioned at the outset, the DOIs um, issued via the AND service um, uh, come from the data site service. And the question was raised as to whether the grey literature um, assigned a DOI would be searchable in data site. And yes, absolutely it will be. Um, it, it's again by data site just treated as another type of resource. And your metadata does get sent to data site where it does become searchable. Very important question for many people is about a cost. Um, and and doesn't charge a fee for minting DOIs for grey literature or for data. Um, so that hasn't changed uh, depending on the resource type. There's no implication there. Uh, this next question Adrian alluded to uh, in his uh, presentation, but we were asked more than once about um, you know why should we swap, swap to DOIs if we're already assigning handles to our theses? And that's really a business decision. As uh, Adrian mentioned, DOIs are a form of handle and they're optimised for citation and identification of references. Uh, something that we do know is that they're very well recognised across the scholarly community. Uh, so they do have, I guess, some credibility, if you like. Um, but that's really up to you as to which what works best for you. Um, you know, whether you prefer to stick with your handles or move to DOIs. Uh, people were interested to know whether the DOIs for their grey literature would appear in Research Data Australia, which is the discovery portal for research data holdings um, across uh, Australian institutions. And the answer to that is no, not as a matter of course. Uh, the metadata streams for the um, and DOI service and uh, for Research Data Australia are actually separate and so there wouldn't be um, an automatic uh, visibility of those DOIs in Research Data Australia. However, where you have grey literature that's related to a data collection that you're describing in Research Data Australia, we would encourage you to include the DOI for your grey literature in the related information element um, in your collection records. This way what you're doing is um, putting in an actionable link to the grey literature from a related data set that's been described in Research Data Australia. So we would encourage you to think about um, how you can maximise the value you get back from the DOIs you meant for both data and grey literature by making those connections um, where possible which help lead users to related resources. So that's something to think about. How can we be sure that only one DOI will be minted for a resource? Well, that's not something that ANS can um, resolve. We don't have a mechanism to check whether a DOI, a DOI has already been minted for a resource. So that's something that 
you would need to determine before minting um, your end. I mean, you can obviously look at things like the Crossref metadata and the data site metadata, um, but that's not a, a service that ANS offers to check for um, check whether DOIs have already been minted for items. The best point to issue a DOI in our workflow, well, really that's a business decision for you to make, depending on how your workflows operate in your organisation. We have been asked this question a couple of times. So what ANS could do, if it's of interest to the community, is facilitate some sharing of workflows. So if people do have documented workflows for how they issue and manage their DOIs for either data or now grey literature or both, we'd be happy to um, put that information somewhere where it could be shared with others who would have an interest in the same um, type of information. Natasha mentioned earlier about um, the primary publication point as being a, a, a criteria for assigning DOIs so that we minimise the risk of duplication of DOIs. Um, and we were asked the question, what do we mean by the primary publication point? And what we mean is that it, the place where that it is the primary place for publishing the resource, it's not likely to be published anywhere else where a DOI could be assigned to it. Nearly there, we're on the home stretch now of the, um, of the questions that were given to us on notice. People asked about reports out of um, the system, so uh, they mentioned the Crossref reports in particular. We can advise that Datasite does provide some statistics for the DOIs minted through the AND service and the uh, URL is up there if you want to have a look at some examples of what you can get back out of the system. Also, um, within the ANS registry, which is where you can manage the DOIs you mint through uh, the ANS service, you can also have a look at, you can also bring up a list of all the DOIs you've minted, check for broken links and things like that. Um, but as noted there, you must already have um, a DOI service account to be able to access these features in the ANS registry. Uh, Adrian mentioned about the additional piece of metadata of resource type that we're asking people to provide so that we can uh, have some idea of how often the service is being used for data and how often it's being used for um, text. Um, the data site metadata, um, you can choose um, to just select text as a, a vocab term, um, as a resource type. But you can also combine it with either free text terms, or we'd recommend using the CASRAE publications resource type list if you wish to have a more granular description of your type. So people asked us, can we specify that it's a report or a conference paper, um, you know, or whatever type of material it is? Uh, that is possible, um, and we would recommend that if you want to do that, that you use the uh, publications resource type list. It's probably also timely to mention that uh, currently at the moment resource type is not a mandatory field for a data site. They have only five mandatory fields for min minting a DOI. Uh, but we do know that uh, data sites are currently reviewing their metadata schema and we're expecting a version a new version to come out later this year and we anticipate that resource type will become a mandatory element at that point um, and will we'll maintain backwards compa compatibility uh, for as long as feasible um, with previous versions but I guess just to highlight that um, while at the moment data sites not asking that for that field as a mandatory element that is likely to change in the not too distant future. Okay, so that completes the questions, responses to questions that we'd already been asked and now is our opportunity or your opportunity to ask questions that uh, perhaps we haven't managed to um, cover today. The first one we have is, we are experiencing requests for theses to be taken down from the repository after the author publishes an article from the thesis research and the journal publisher demands it. Is it, it is therefore not persistent access 
it is yeah, therefore not persistent access to the thesis. It's not actually a question, but it, I think it's more a looking for comment. I don't suppose you can anticipate that there will be a request to take the thesis down. Yeah, I don't think you, you'd, you'd necessarily not allocate a, you know, an identifier to the thesis just because someone may ask you to take it down. Um, it is possible when you know, the object is not available for a particular reason that you have a little tombstone for the thing that says, yes, it was, uh, it, it was available here, but whatever, it was taken down because uh, it was harmful to babies or you know, it was killing people or something like that. So uh, um, in this instance, I suppose you can maintain a, a tombstone that says yeah, this has been taken down because now it's been republished by a publisher or something like that. Um, Sounds like a bit of an, an edge case and not something that you could um, really predict uh, at the time. And at the time, I think, of publishing the thesis, you would assume that this is a, um, uh, a valid part of the scholarly uh, record, and um, I would proceed on that on that uh, basis. So I don't think we, you'd stop just because of there are some edge cases like this. Okay, um, we've got, hi, Sam here. Can we have DOI for a pre-published version of the research work and then have the DOI by the publisher after the work is published? Does this corrupt the integrity of the reporting and analysis? Well, whether, what others, the, whether Natasha and uh, Jerry want to say something, uh, Crossroof are certainly proposing this. I think they propose to bring it in online in August, and uh, there's some discussion happening now on the Crossref blog, so if you'd like to go and um, uh, comment there, that would be a good place to have the, the conversation. Uh, I think uh, their assumption is that the two would be linked, and that the two identifiers would be formally linked as well, uh, and that therefore, um, if you wanted to know the overall impact of the thing, then you could add the two uh, identifiers together, or if you needed to know that there is a, uh, a formally published uh, thing later, then, uh, then uh, the, the two identifiers were linked. Jerry, uh, anything to add there on Natasha? Uh, no, I don't think I've got anything to add to that. I think you've probably covered it, Adrian, unless Natasha's got anything to add from her experience. No, I, I think you would just link them in the way that that Adrian suggested, because if you assign it to the preprint, um, it gives a chance for people to read that and cite it, and you still get statistics on that DOI, and then you'll have one also on the published version that will be linked through the metadata that you provide for the DOI. And certainly Jeff, in his uh, blog posting, maybe we can um, grab that blog posting and send it around or something. Uh, uh, there's a good discussion there on um, the relationship between a preprint and the published um, version. Um, if a publication in the repository has been assigned to DOI and then is updated or revised, is a new DOI required? Yes. <laughs> the idea, I guess, with a DOI is that you're assigning it to something that is, I guess, fixed. So if you have got revisions to an item, uh, and this is a question that comes up quite often in the data world, where you have revisions or changes to the item, a new DOI should be assigned. If somebody cited an earlier version, then uh, that should uh, remain as is. If someone's citing a later version, that should remain as is. So in terms of that sort of reproducibility, um, then uh, Anything that has that changes, new versions should have a new DOI. One of the things, and it pertains to the previous question as well, one of the things that the data site metadata schema allows you to do is to link related materials. So you can indicate through your data site metadata that this this DOI is related to that DOI. So a, a previous version of a child of or some other sort of relationship. So it's possible to express those relationships through the data site metadata. So that if people are, uh, find, you know, 
that the sign version one, they can also um, be alerted to the fact that there's a version two. And I think we could have a, a, a versioning policy that was visible there for these kind of things. Uh, sometimes, if you know, it was a typo, then you know you have a policy that says for uh, non-trivial um, or non-consequential you know updates like uh, full stops and things like that, then you know we do not change the version, but we could have that uh, explicit. Whereas if you've you know, had to retract something and change something, then obviously that's a new version that we could have a good uh, new DOI for that. But whatever the decisions are there, we could have those policies um, uh, explicit at the repository. So a number of institutions have created policies and guidelines around DOI minting just for that purpose. Um, so I believe there's some examples of those linked on the ANS website, so perhaps we can send those around. If checking for existing DOIs, is Crossref and Datacite the only databases that are available to check for existing DOIs? Well, uh, just to be clear here, there, as we said, there are a number of consortia that operate DOI infrastructure at that top level. I believe there's about 10 at the moment. Certainly Datacite and Crossref are the two big ones, and then there's a number of regional um, operators. I'm not 100% sure, to, you know, I'd have to get back to you on the, the technicalities of that. I, I know that there is a service that's Crossref now, um, the Crossref and data site certainly run to say, if you give us this, data, this DOI, we can tell you who the, you know, which consortium minted the DOI and therefore where to uh, send your query to about the metadata. So that, that's certainly a service they, they, they provide. I, I can't tell you offhand whether the other eight um, um, uh, big data site registration agencies um, have, uh, have the same uh, metadata search infrastructure online and whether that's available through that you know, brokerage service. But again, we can put a link to that up afterwards. The, the regional ones are, you know, the, there's one for the Korean you know, KISTI and uh, there's one for a Japanese national information service and um, so they're very sort of specific. But certainly Crossref takes in pretty much all journal publishers and um, data site, you know, most of the data centres. The DOI tool doesn't appear to allow you to select a resource type unless you accompany it with a text description. Can someone verify if this is the case or provide advice? So I'm assuming that that question pertains to the manual minting tool in the ANS registry. I've, so there is a control vocabulary in the recommended um, metadata set there uh, that you can choose from for resource type and text is one of the selections in that vocabulary. But there's also a free text box associated with that where you can then indicate additional information like uh, you know a more granular level of um, description of the resource type. So look for that free text box and as I mentioned earlier we'd recommend you look at the CASRAE vocabulary to um, you know enhance your description of the actual resource type. And certainly with the introduction uh, of here the requirement to provide a resource type for when you're minting for grade literature and as Jerry flagged, the introduction of um, mandatory uh, resource types for uh, all data site DOIs, you know, during this year is what we're anticipating the timeline will be. With those two developments, we'll be re-looking at the ANS tools just to make sure that they're really doing what we want them to do. A question here, how does the machine-to-machine -machine information interchange work? Information, information exchange, is that between an service and the repository? That's possibly. Anyway, let's answer that question. So uh, either you can come to the ANS website and the services website, log in and create a, a, a DOI by giving you your mandatory metadata. And uh, so that's a manual way of doing it. Or you can do it by uh, having it plugged into your workflow so that for example, when somebody publishes an object in your repository, at that point, your system, your software system, contacts and there's a little authentication thing that checks your it's actually 
you know, you have an account with us uh, and your IP address is the right one. Uh, and then that's, there's a machine-to-machine -machine, um, exchange that says, uh, and says, here's your DOI, uh, your system says, here's the metadata, and uh, then that's uh, registered back with the international DOI system. And that can all, that's all done within a split second or within a couple of seconds because we have to communicate off to Europe as well. Um, so anyway, that's, how, that's in, gen, in general terms how the machine-to-machine uh, -machine thing works. We, we recommend that you do it that way because it, it means that it's, it's, a, um, it's kind of integrated into your workflow. It means that as soon as something is published, then you know, that's available in the metadata of your published object. And I've just put up on the screen um, some links. The top link about the ANS DOI service is a general introduction to the ANS DOI service, but if you are interested in a bit more of the nitty gritty, uh, how it works, uh, go down to the service documentation. Um, and I suspect most of the questions you have around how the service works would be answered in, in that. Um, so uh, if you are interested in that aspect, please have a look at the documentation there. It's, it's not really a question, I think it's more of a comment. It says you can redact the part thesis that is published, i.e. chapters become journal articles. Mm -hmm. But I think you'd then get a different DOI. Probably because then you have a different number of chapters in your thesis. Yeah. Would access by a request a copy be sufficient if the metadata record remains persistent? And I think this question came in when we were having the discussion about um, pulling off a thesis because the journal publisher requested it. Mm -hmm. um, and you were talking about a tombstone record. So you could put something like this, request a copy on that. So it's like, immediate, like immediated access to the material rather than uh, just that click here and download, I think. Mm -hmm. It's probably the... That, that's right, Jerry. yep. And then... We would take that as a I'd say comment. Yes. That would be a, that would be a comment, yep. yep. Is reporting on DOIs minted by an institution supported by the Site My Data DOI API? No, not at the moment. So it's not something that's supported by data site. That's not my data. Yes. That's so right. data site at the moment. So Crossref does you know, provide monthly resolutions, etc. Data site is is developing that um, capability. Uh, so uh, it, it's not possible to do that at the moment uh, for institution by institution. Uh, but can I just mention that you can log into AND services and go to the My DOIs section and see a list of all the DOIs that you have minted at your institution. So I'm not sure exactly what that question covered, but I'm just going to add that. Can I mint a DOI for data independent of a scholarly activity? For instance, a repository has open data, scholar one might extract it for paper one, the scholar two might extract it for paper two, Paper one and two have DOI for their data, but can the data in the repository have its own independent DOI from ANS, or should we use something else? So I think that might be a question about related data and related publications. Or is um, it a question about um, sections of the data? Because if you're using the same data, you would have the data's DOI. So I'll just reread the question at the end of it. Paper one and paper two have DOI for their data. Can the data in the repository have its yeah. own independent DOI from ANS, or should we use something else? Uh, yes, the, well, if you have data in your repository, you can, and we recommend it does, have a, a DOI, uh, and you can admit that through the ANS service, even if it's not related to papers in your repository. And if Scholar 1 and Scholar 2 are using the data, they should be using a DOI already associated with the data, not minting a new one for the fact that they've pulled down the data. Yeah, so if they've, yeah, if they've, oh, it's quite, it, if they've processed the data or changed the data anyway and actually created a new data set out of that, uh, Scholar 1 pulls down the data, does something clever with it and produces what is essentially a new data set or a derived data set, then that derived data set could in fact have its own um, DOI because it is something new. Um, so again, you can um, link things together and reference things in the metadata associated with the record so that the relationship 
um, between the two items can be understood. Now, given that access is IP limited, do all library staff who intend to use the DOI web form need to register? So uh, access to the DOI web form is not IP limited. Uh, access to the web form is just if you have an account and you log in, you, know, you could have a generic account for your um, uh, institution or you can get several people uh, from the same institution also logging in. Uh, there's no IP restriction on the manual web form. Uh, you just you need to have the account, the password and the uh, account name. Uh, the IP restriction uh, I mentioned it was only, that only applies for the machine to machine uh, service. Okay, so when minting, when minting the DOI, is there a field for copyright or license information? Madly grabs her copy of the data site <laughs> schema. <laughs> uh, I'll look at that. The first page I open up to says that there is a data type, that there is an option called copyrighted. Um, but look, that's probably not a question uh, to answer perhaps on the fly. I'd like to actually have a closer look at the schema and see how that would best suit that unless Adrian happens to know off the top of his head. No. It's a very complex, it's a very comprehensive uh, metadata scheme, the uh, DOI metadata kernel as it's called. Um, so it has a lot of stuff in there. You're not required to necessarily fill it all out in order to get oh. Uh, a, a, a DOI, but you are required yeah. to provide five slash six elements. Yep, and we can include a link to the schema if people are interested, and I can see that there is a, a data site element for rights, um, but as Adrian mentioned, uh, it's not one of the mandatory elements, although if that's something you would like to include, um, you certainly can. But in the follow-up information after this webinar, I'll send a link to the current version of the schema so that you get a sense for how comprehensive it actually is uh, and what your options might be if you're trying to determine what metadata you'll provide as part of the minting process. And also under rights, there's an example record that shows you can actually link to a URI there in the metadata, like the Creative Commons URI, when you're providing that information. Just on that, the, the amount and quality of metadata for a, a DOI, uh, look, there, there is a minimum amount that gets you your DOI. You then need to think about what some of the uses are. Uh, a very important one that's coming on board, and I would just you know, uh, advise people to keep that in mind, is that Crossref and DataSide are really stepping up their cooperation around the linkages between a published article and it's the data that underpins it or vice versa. So I would actually start to recommend that people think about uh, if you have got the related, if, you, if you've got, you're bidding a DOI for a, um, some great literature and it has, you know what the uh, related data sets are, that it, it will be in your interest, I think, to make that explicit in the DOI metadata because the big uh, DOI consortiums are going to start pulling that information and then creating a global view of the links between data sets and literature. And this would be a really good way of getting your stuff in there. If a data set has a fixed shared DOI, can the DOI be changed if the data is moved to another location? Well, no, that's the premise, I guess, of, of a DOI is that you should be able to update the location to which the DOI points. That's how the persistence is maintained. However, if the DOI is issued by Figshare, then it's up to Figshare to note that change. The Castry vocab doesn't cover lots of important grey literature types, submissions, evaluations, case studies, case studies, etc. Are there other resource type vocabs that you can suggest we use? Uh, there are plenty of others around that you could you could choose from. I could provide a, a, a you know a a list of probably three or four. Um, I guess we've recommended Casray because that's the one recommended by a data site, but if people are interested in others, I can send links around to, to a couple of others that we're aware of. Still on the CASRAE vocab, um, it says, if using the CASRAE vocab for further granularity, that goes in a free text field. 
Uh, yes, in the in the if you're using the manual minting um, option, yes, it does. So you can pull down uh, at that higher level um, resource type equals text from the control vocabulary, and then the rate of granularity goes into a free text box. We'll put the Casare drop-down list into there, uh, and others if people want to suggest them. Can you meet DOIs for material not in your repository if it is being managed by a secure and reliable organisation with a commitment to long-term management? You would want to have uh, the, uh, a very good uh, understanding with the other organisation. Might be a case by case. Yeah. Look at sort of thing. And that is the last of the questions. There is a comment that's... Oh, there's, one, there's one there from data. How often does data site update the ANS oh, reports? Oh, sorry, and I missed that one. Yes. I, th I think that's actually about, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's about how many times, does, how frequent does the citation count for a metadata record in Research Data Australia get refreshed. Um, but it doesn't actually get refreshed from, it doesn't draw that information from data site, it actually draws it from the Thomson Reuters data citation index. Yep, as far as the, the, the communications between ANS and data site, so if you update something in our service, we immediately register it with uh, data site. As far as I know, that's uh, available immediately. Um, there is, when you mint, sometimes there is a, you know, a little bit of a delay within the DOI system um, uh, for some updates that may take you know, 24 hours for it to really sink through the uh, uh, redirect services in the handle system, but uh, we uh, our stuff is immediately registered with uh, data site. Well, we are right on time. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming along today and for your questions. It's been a really useful session. I hope you have found it useful too. Inevitably, some of you at least will have questions after today, so if you do, please um, contact either your ANS outreach officer or email services at ans.org.au and then it will get passed on to the most appropriate person, whether it's a technical question or a policy type question. So thank you all for attending today. Thanks to Adrian, Susanna and Natasha for your participation and we look forward to seeing you at another ANS event in the not too distant future. <laughs>